This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Zero Carbon Go by 2060. And over what are China's plans? Opportunities and challenges. Health and road is a major opportunity to do exactly that. Wildly population collapse. More multilateral cooperation. We have to all work together. Hello and welcome to a Global Thinker special program, a roundtable on BRI Grain Development, Grain BRI, and Grain Shared Future. Now, this event is hosted by CGTN and BRI International Grain Development Coalition. My name is Wang Guan, and I'm a news anchor at CGTN. This summer, we have seen wildfires erupting all over the world, sadly, and we're struggling with soaring temperatures, unprecedented in decades. Heavy rains and floods have caused death, while droughts are destroying crops and worsening the ongoing global food crisis. As the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warned us that climate change is occurring faster than anticipated, many countries have committed to decarbonization. Now, China is among the most ambitious of them all. It has set a carbon peaking deadline of 2030 and zero carbon go by 2060. China has also pledged to stop building new coal plants abroad and is focusing on a Grain Belt and Road Initiative. Now, for more on this, we're honored to have influential global climate policymakers, grain leaders, and heads of non-governmental organizations for sustainable development to discuss today's climate actions, actions taken by China as well as by the international community. Now, first of all, I'd like to introduce to all of you our very distinguished group of panelists joining us today for our discussion. We have Dr. Zhou Guomei, Director General of the Department of International Cooperation at the Ministry of Ecology and Environment of China. We also have Mr. Zhang Jianyu, Executive President, BRI Green Development Institute. Also, we have guests joining us online. They are Mr. Marco Lambertini, Co-Chair of BRI International Grain Development Coalition and Director General of WWF International. Mr. Eric Sohan is convener of the BRI GC Advisory Committee. He's a former UN's Under Secretary General and advisor of the World Resources Institute. Now, Mr. Simon Tay, joining us online, is Associate Professor and Chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. Mr. Zhou Ji is advisor to the BRIGC Advisory Committee and CEO and President of the Energy Foundation China. Mr. Kevin Gallagher is Dean at Interim and Professor of Global Development Policy and Director of Global Development at Policy Center Boston University. Mr. Mustafa Haider Saeed is the Executive Director of the Pakistan China and Mr. Dimitri DeBoer is Director of Asia and Client Earth. Welcome to all of you. We also have uh, members of the audience joining us from around the world. Thank you so much for being part of this. Uh, we would very much like your participation later on. If you have any comments, observations, or questions, uh, more than welcome to raise them. Now, we have His Excellency Huang Renqiu, Ecology and Environment Minister of China, who earlier shared with us details on China's decarbonization campaign at home and abroad. Take a listen. Hi, 和朋友们表示热烈的欢迎 
，深化绿色丝绸之路合作啊，与大家分享三点看法：一是强化合作引领，依托绿色联盟等国际交流合作平台，进一步对接合作需求，挖掘合作潜能，凝聚合作共识；二是探索绿色创新。持续推动绿色产业合作模式和投融资模式的创新，为绿色丝绸之路合作啊注入新的动力。三是推动互惠共享，分享更多的、更可推广、更可复制的绿色解决方案，不断提高“一带一路”建设的绿色底色和成色。最后啊，作为 COP 十五大会的主席。我呼吁各方充分展示保护全球生物多样性的政治意愿和灵活性，推动达成兼具雄心和务实平衡的2020年后全球生物多样性框架，共同谱写全球生物多样性保护的崭新篇章。预祝本次论坛圆满成功！谢谢大家。Now, thanks so much. That was Minister Huan of China. Thanks so much for taking time off and addressing our roundtable. Now, another comprehensive plan to address climate challenges comes from Singapore. Last year, Singapore unveiled its Green Plan 2030, which sets ambitious and concrete targets for the next 10 years. Now, Her Excellency Grace Fu, its Minister of Sustainability and the Environment of Singapore, she explains how the city-state aims to be greener. Take a listen. Your Excellency Minister Huang Renqiu, Minister of Ecology and Environment, Mr. Marco Lambertini, WWF International Director General, and BRIC Co-Chair, Roundtable Participants. Next year marks the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative, conceived by President Xi Jinping in 2013. The initiative has made steady progress over the past decade. Including through the formation of the International Green Development Coalition in 2019, or BRIC for short, and its growing membership, BRIC's principles remains as relevant today as a decade ago. Extreme weather events have soared into frequency and intensity, with many regions experiencing long periods of droughts, heat waves, and record flash floods. This has further caused water stresses. And aggravated existing imbalances in the food and energy markets. More than ever, we must band together to seek solutions and double down efforts towards net zero emission. Green innovation is a key pillar in climate action. Technology and innovation are needed to create new solutions and overcome resource restrictions. Singapore will continue to contribute to global efforts. In sustainable economic and social development, the Sino-Singapore Tianjin Eco City is a case in point. In one decade, an area of non-arable salt pans was transformed into a low-carbon, livable, and vibrant smart city. Its zero-waste strategy is being replicated in other cities. In Singapore, our Green Plan 2030 charts ambitious. And concrete targets over the next 10 years to strengthen Singapore's commitments under the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. It is my wish that the BRIC and its partners continue to advance important conversations on green development, so that we can learn from one another, pursue our climate endeavours, and build a better world together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Madam Minister Grace Fu from Singapore. Thank you for addressing our roundtable. Now I would like to move on to our panel discussion.、Uh, Director General Zhou,、uh, why don't I start with you? We know that the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment is really at the forefront、uh, in building this Green Belt and Road Initiative.、Um, you know, the Green BRI is not just a conception but also an action plan.、Um, why don't you start by telling us a bit about the progress? Of building a green BRI over the years. Thank you so much.、Uh, it is a great pleasure to be with today's、uh, roundtable, and thank you for your question. We believe it is very important.
to develop the belt and the road in a green way. So far, we have achieved uh, much more progress in terms of uh, green BRI. First, we have very strong policy support. The Chinese government published a set of uh, policy documents, such as uh, guidelines for environmental protection in overseas investment. Second, building green partnerships. In the past uh, three years, since uh, its launching, a BRI GC has been expanding green partnerships. Now it has over 150 partners. And third, I would like to say we're promoting practical cooperation in green and low carbon area. A study shows that DRI has brought down the overall carbon emission intensity in relevant BRI countries. Lastly, we support capacity building. In the last few years, we have provided capacity building for more than 3,000 officials and technical staff from all over uh, 100 countries. All this uh, progress has been uh, recognized and got very positive uh, response from international communities. That's what I would like to share with our participants. Thank you so much, um, Director General. I think it's very important for people like you, uh, you know, on behalf of the Chinese government for articulating those policy initiatives. Mr. Soheim, let me turn to you. Um, you worked on the issue of climate change in different capacity uh, in Norway, at the United Nations, and now you're moving to the East, uh, uh, working as a convener of the BRIGC Advisory Committee. Of course, gr building a green BRI is a work in process. Um, how would that contribute to a greener uh, collective future of mankind? I believe uh, very simply that Belt and Road is the one chance in a generation to get it right. Look, China is now 80% of all production solar panels in the world, 80% of all new hydropower in the world last year, 80% of all offshore wind, 70% of all batteries, and incredibly 99% of all electric buses. So China is basically totally dominant now in all the green technologies the world needs. The rest of the world simply need to get up early in the morning to compete with China. But this gives an enormous opportunity to get the green investments into the Belt and Road countries. And if I may add, China is not only leading on green technologies, but also more and more on green practices. No nation has brought down pollution as fast as China. China has done in seven years what took America and Europe 30 years to achieve in pollution control. China is number one in greening deserts in, in Mongolia. Southern Chinese cities like Suzhou and Shenzhen are among the greenest cities in the world in competition with Singapore, uh, for sure, that they are very, very green. And the way Shenzhen province has cleaned up the rivers is outsta outstanding. So there is so much to celebrate from China. China can also learn from the Belt and Road countries, and that's the promise of Belt and Road. Let's go into this together. Let's bring the best practice and investment from China, but let's learn from each other. We do need to learn from each other, especially considering that uh, the countries participating in the BRI are at very different stages of development. Uh, we have Singapore, for example, uh, where our next guest is from, Mr. Simon Tay. Singapore, of course, being this industrialized country, um, you know, enjoying one of the highest GDP per capita in the world. Um, but we also have less developed countries, less industrialized ones, where um, energy shortage, energy shortfall uh, is a daily routine, for example. So, Simon, uh, what's your expectations uh, from this agrarian BRI? How do you see that materializing in the future? Well, thank you very much for including me in this discussion. My country is very small, but sometimes small can be beautiful. Small can be a catalyst for change, especially at the very concrete city level. So Singapore's experience, as you said, is really to come up quickly up the development path. And as Minister Solheim has said before, we always kept the green envelope in the mindset. So today, as we go forward in BRI, besides the giant technology strong China, Singapore and other players in the region can show the importance of law and policy, 
deploying technology even if we didn't create it, partnering people with technology, and the importance of using finance in the right way. Here in ASEAN and Asia, you said developing world. You're right. That's a key difference between us and the developed world. We need to continue to grow, to develop, to provide income for many millions of people across developing Asia. But at the same time, we've got to do it in a way which is really improves the situation, not just ameliorates it from business as usual. So Singapore, I hope, can be a catalyst. It can be a bit of a pathfinder. And certainly within our limits, can be a partner for China and many other countries seeking these paths of development towards a greener and better future. Yeah, I would say uh, Singapore's participation is uh, much welcomed and anticipated uh, going forward in building this green BRI. I want to turn to Mr. Zhou Ji. Um, you are one of the leaders of the BRIGC, a very important organization, uh, you know, advocating countries, uh, bringing countries on the same page when it comes to building a greener BRI. Talk to us about the role of BRIGC in uh, building this green BRI. There, there might be uh, two or three major things to do. Number one, uh, awareness improvement uh, based on uh, scientific knowledge and the better practice. Uh, but certainly, no need to say most of the developing countries, uh, especially uh, those in uh, Southeastern Asia or South Asia, they are underway for industrialization and urbanization, for uh, modernization, but they are faced with very heavy burden or task to develop their infrastructure and including uh, road, uh, uh, electricity, uh, telecommunication, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this platform can change or uh, capacity building, uh, activity, uh, engaging different stakeholders together to address the issues uh, sector by sector, issue by issue, but mainly focusing on how to greening, how to green uh, uh, their development uh, by introducing uh, clean energy, uh, low carbon infrastructure, as well as capacity building. I want to ask you about the challenges that you briefly touched upon. Uh, what do you think are the barriers facing the global south, the less developed countries uh, in their low carbon transition? We need to build up political trust this, this will serve as a precondition for all the other uh, cooperation. For all the work, we need talent to take lead, to organize, to, uh, to do some creative work. Uh, many developing countries, uh, they have a series of lack of financial resources. And then we need work together to establish the financial mechanism to fund uh, uh, renewable or efficiency, energy efficiency, uh, etc., etc. Mr. Lambertini, uh, let me turn to you, if I may. Biodiversity is such an important component of our sustainable future. Um, you've been engaged in this area for for decades. Talk to us about the importance of biodiversity when it comes to our collective um, sustainable future. Thank you very much. And first of all, let me just say um, thanks for highlighting this dimension, the dimension of biodiversity, because too often we, we forget that actually the ecological crisis we are facing today has got two sides to it. One is, of course, the destabilization of climate. The other one is the loss of nature. And the two are actually interconnected. We're talking about uh, uh, an extinction crisis with more than a million species on the brink of extinction. We're talking about wildlife population collapse over the last uh, few decades, blink of an eye uh, compared to the evolutionary history of these species. We're talking about having lost half of the forest, half of the coral reefs, 80% of the wetlands, and the trend unfortunately continues. So the evidence is there and has never been so clear. So all this is taking a new dimension, the dimension of an imperative need to deal with both climate change and nature loss so, Mr. Uh, Lambertini, can you briefly explain to us the, you know, the, the background behind you, which is fantastic, by the way, nature positive by 2030. What does that mean? I'm glad you noticed it. Uh, it's <laughs> hard to miss. Exactly what, uh, 
First of all, nature, uh, nature conservation, protection of forests, protection of the many carbon sinks in the ocean and on land uh, uh, is a critical component of the fight against climate change. Today, we know exactly where we want to be on climate. We have a, a global agreement, a Paris agreement. We have a, a global goal for climate, which is net zero emissions in order to reach, by 2050, in order to reach uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, net zero uh, uh, loss of nature is not enough. We have lost so much of nature. Nature mm. can bounce back. We know that. And so nature positive is the global goal, the double global goal that together with climate uh, and neutrality will really uh, help us uh, achieve the sustainability. Dimitri, let me turn to you. China has announced that it will not build uh, any new coal-fired power projects abroad. But there are so many questions uh, once this announcement is made, right? Uh, what are you going to do with the existing coal-fired power plants along the BRI? Uh, is, is this go too ambitious, perhaps? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think that China's decision to build no new coal plants overseas has huge implications for the global climate transition. In the years before President Xi's announcement, uh, some estimated that you know, the, all of the coal plants uh, that ha have been announced for the Belt and Road, if all of them would have been built, uh, we might see uh, the world rising by 2.7 degrees uh, uh, temperature increase by the end of this century, if you can imagine 2.7 degrees, that really would be catastrophic. And you know that now that China has decided not to build uh, coal plants overseas anymore, all the other investors are also hesitant to finance them. And so I personally believe that uh, this announcement is actually the best news for the climate since the Paris Agreement. All right, uh, Kevin, the same question. How realistic do you think it is um, you know, for China uh, not to build uh, or committing itself not to build any more coal-fired power projects abroad? It's very realistic. We're already starting to see it. If all the overseas coal plants with Chinese participation and under construction and planning are canceled, we calculate that annual carbon emissions will reduce by about 594 million tons which is roughly equal to what Canada emits on an annual basis. But what's most exemplary about China's policy is not only that it will ban coal, but that it will increase financing in low carbon development across the world. This is the central task of our time, and China's policy largely leapfrogs what the West is doing. Western governments and Western institutions uh, are also banning coal and banning oil and banning gas overseas but they're also not committing to transfer, transferring to new carbon, new low carbon development. Uh, so China is really poised to be a leader here uh, and has enormous financing capacity. And as we heard earlier, technological superiority in solar, wind and electric vehicles that could really help the diffusion of low carbon development across the world. Uh, Mr. Zhang Jianyu, let me turn to you. Thank you for uh, bearing with us. Um, you know, there are so many challenges facing the developing world, the global south, uh, when it comes to adopting uh, greener um, energy sources and making this grain transition. There's path dependence, there are geopolitics, as we just discussed. What do you think are the main challenges and really how can we overcome them? Now, certainly, you know, the whole world is facing this uh, un unparalleled challenge of the heat wave and all the the climate change challenges, but still we need to remember every country is still their own sovereign uh, uh, authority of themselves. Yeah. They need to have their own rationale why they're doing this, whether it's the social, uh, economical, technical, or political reasons, I mean, given you know, all the chaos that's going on in the world. Clearly, it's really hard for the developing countries just to internalize this externality, climate externality by themselves. They need the help of the other countries, and that's why I think China is so great in this instance because China step up, stand up and saying that we want to do the green BRI, we want to help the countries to develop low emission uh, energy and low carbon systems. So I, I think the whole world need to recognize that if we really want to solve this problem, we, it's not something that we can, uh, we can impose that and push other people to do. We need to develop the global rationale why it makes sense to do this. And again, I think China is making a really good example of uh, leapfrogging in all, all the technologies and so on and so forth. But I, again, I, I emphasize, I think the support part is really important and is really the time for the whole world, not just China itself, but the entire uh, developed nations 
to join hands together to step up their effort to the developing countries uh, so that we can overcome this challenge all together. Yeah, that is uh, very promising indeed. You know, Pakistan is a very good friend of uh, ours uh, and also a key partner of the BRI. Uh, Mustafa, thank you for being with us. Uh, we know Pakistan is a very strong partner um, since the inception of the BRI. Uh, when you talk about China-Pakistan economic co corridor, among other things, uh, how receptive are the Pakistanis towards this conception of building a green BRI? We see that BRI has been a get-out-of-jail card for the developing world, if you will, for the global south. And there is evidence to suggest that renewable energy projects and green projects actually generate more jobs in developing countries than traditional fossil fuel projects and more employment opportunities. And I think that the next Belt and Road Forum in the post-pandemic world can actually exclusively focus on this and can be a great opportunity to actually act as a workshop of world leaders of BRI countries that are part and parcel of the BRI. You know, uh, Director General Joe, we've just heard from Mustafa, uh, so many countries, so many uh, partner organizations are looking to China for leadership uh, when it comes to making this green transition. And or what are China's plans going forward uh, when it comes to building a green BRI? Uh, first, I think we can uh, strengthen BRI's al alignment with the uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals for 2030 and support BRI participating countries to implement the multilateral environmental agreement. I think we will uh, make our contributions to post-pandemic uh, green recovery for the international uh, community and uh, to promote the uh, green and low carbon transition. So for BRIGC, we will continue to conduct uh, the uh, capacity building, the technology transfer, and also uh, the, a lot of this kind of workshops and programs uh, to enhance communications on the policies, standards, and technologies, and to share good practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, Minister Huang also mm -hmm. said that he hopes mm -hmm. uh, in a, a green transition can be done in an ambitious yet mm -hmm. balanced manner for developing countries. Uh, and that really leads to my next question, Mr. Soheim. What role can BRI cooperation play uh, in you know, bringing about the green transition in a realistic yet ambitious manner? I think, let, let's be honest, I mean, in the past, mm -hmm. Belt and Road was a lot about uh, brown development, investments in coal. But after President Xi made the promise that China will stop all overseas coal investments, it's part of Belt and Road and so important. And of course, you see all the green corridors, China, Laos, or Yunnan, Laos Railroad was opened last year. The Trans Malaysia Railroad is in, under construction. Next here, Bandung Jakarta Railroad mm. in Indonesia will open, mm. and I really hope it will be taken all the way through Java to Surabaya. It'll be an enormous contribution to Indonesia, and China, of course, also financed and built the Hanoi Metro. So these green corridors make green transport possible. It's part of Belt and Road, and so important. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. Uh, Mr. John, we've heard from Eric uh, talking about so many concrete examples where you know, uh, grain railroads are being built, uh, you know, how those grain projects are benefiting uh, recipient countries. But there are different voices, right, from the Western media, the Western commentators, uh, accusing or questioning China's uh, motives, uh, questioning how grain the BRI can really be. Uh, how, how do you understand that? How do you look at those Western allegations? Uh, I think every country really needs to do uh, whatever they can, you know, to really step up the effort to do this together. But I think the Western sort of what I call that deceptive and misleading uh, picturing of China uh, either is doing the wrong thing or not doing enough, just simply not true. Uh, I, I think that uh, if you look across the board of, the, uh, of the, who is making the real help uh, to the developing countries uh, to relieve people from poverty, to help to green uh, their country, and to build the infrastructure to uh, improve the uh, life standard, of their people. China is probably doing more than all the other countries combined together. 
Yeah, there's so much politicization, uh, finger pointing going around, uh, even in the realm of dealing with the issue of climate change, uh, which is a limited time offer. Uh, Kevin, let me turn to you. Uh, funding is very, very important. Grain financing uh, is a much uh, discussed issue of the day. Uh, what are some ways, in your opinion, to improve BRI participating countries' grain financing capabilities? China is now a green financing policy leader. China financed the largest solar power plant in South America and Argentina, uh, wind power in Ethiopia, solar power in the Philippines. And according to our research that was published in the Chinese Journal uh, of the Chinese Academy of Social Science called China and the World Economy, there's a trillion dollars worth of investments in BRI countries and in other developing countries around the world in clean energy that uh, China could invest in and other countries could invest in either. Uh, given that China has superior technological capabilities, overseas investments in these technologies can be win-win for partners in the global south, for the Chinese economy, and the global climate. China and BRI countries could also develop, develop a green BRI safety net for situations and circumstances such as the current predicament when it makes it difficult for countries to finance commitments in the short term. Uh, you talk about uh, the fact that Mustafa also mentioned, uh, you know, the importance of grain financing. Mustafa, let me turn to you. Uh, grain innovation is so important, right? Uh, how do you see the BRI in uh, facilitating global cooperation when it comes to grain innovation? Because what we've seen so far is a fair share of global division, not cooperation, uh, even when it comes to grain growth. So when we talk about innovation, I think that if we institutionalize uh, a joint working group of greening BRI, of different BRI corridors. For example, there's a jo joint working group on Gwadar, on ports and pipelines in Pakistan. If we institutionalize this consultative working group with all BRI, BRI countries and China on greening the future projects of outbound investments from China, I think that would be a fantastic first step China is very open to transfer of technology and sharing its prowess in this regard. I think that would be a great first step because this has to be, as some of my friends have said, and Kevin has also alluded to, it has to be a lifestyle change, uh, Mr. Wang. It has to be a lifestyle change and it has to also now uh, start with individuals and citizens uh, and that sync synergy between the governments and the citizens of all of these countries has to be very yeah, real. Yeah. And this, I think China can play a leading and critical role. Uh, Mr. Lambertini, let me turn to you. The BRIGC um, is working very hard on advising the BRI participating countries. For example, it recently released this grain development guidance for BRI projects and also the BRI grain development case study report. In what ways do you think these uh, initiatives, these guidances, reports have helped um, the BRI projects to be greener? Let me highlight one dimension, one, 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 one initiative that I think is particularly important, uh, and it is the so-called um, traffic light system. Um, that's, uh, that's a system that is designed to effectively assess uh, the um, greenness uh, the compliance with green standards of the various um, BRI funded projects. Uh, and the two dimensions here which are important. The first one is to base the traffic light system on ever more rigorous uh, and clear metrics and indicators of uh, sustainability vis-a-vis -vis the different type of projects, whether it is energy or linear infrastructure or others. And secondly, <clears throat> try to, uh, over time, uh, I think really move from uh, uh, the current system to a system that is embraced uh, at, uh, from a regulatory perspective, particularly by the key institutions, the, the, the China's, China's development banks, that are critical in, uh, in providing the finance to these projects. So it is an exciting initiative. It uh, can be further strengthened and will work in that direction, I'm sure. Hopefully, that will happen sooner rather than later. Uh, Dimitri, what do you think? Or let's say, in what ways do you think the BRIGC is making a difference. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wang. Well, I think there's uh, an incredible difference being made here. Um, you know, since the publication of those uh, reports that you mentioned, uh, the Chinese government has issued a series of policies uh, on greening China's overseas investment. Uh, 
uh, such as uh, the, the traffic light system, uh, which uh, Marco Lambertini just mentioned. And these policies are clearly drawing a lot of inspiration from the BRIGC uh, work. Um, and more importantly, what we're seeing is that these uh, policy documents are already leading to real positive changes on the ground. Uh, for example, last year we conducted trainings uh, on environmental risk with China's largest financial institutions, and I was really impressed uh, to learn how actively they were working to ensure that their investments will really be green. Um, and and I, I think we've also noticed that there are fewer Chinese overseas projects now with major environmental harm. All right, we do have a good number of online audience jo joining us in today's discussion, and they do have some comments and questions, as I understand. Um, if, you have, if you do, please raise your hand. All right, uh, that gentleman. Uh, first of all, my name is David. I'm from Ethiopia. My question goes to Your Excellency, Mr. Eric. Uh, do carbon peak and carbon neutrality conflict with economic development, uh, especially for less developed countries? How to achieve both goals? It's a great question, but the 21st century is very different because you now have all the policies which are good for the environment, good for people health, and good for the economy at the same time. So it's triple, triple, triple win. And let me just give a couple of examples from China, because China is the biggest developing uh, nation economy. I mean, India is the same. Half of all electric cars in the world are now running on Chinese roads. Look, in the past, China didn't have a massive car industry. It didn't get the gasoline uh, car industry. But now China has an enormous opportunity to get so many jobs from electric vehicles, we see any number of companies coming up, and we see China dominating the electric vehicle industry. 21st century is about the win-wins, how developing nations can create hundreds of millions of jobs while going green at the same time. All right, any more questions? Okay, that lady in the second row, please. Um, my name is Cho Yu Kim, and I'm from Korea, and my question is to Mr. Dimitri. What areas do you think BRI participating countries should prioritize to learn from each other and work with each other in pushing forward green and sustainable development? Thank you uh, for that question. So, so my, my opinion is that international cooperation on green development is really, really important right now. Um, and, and thankfully, we are seeing more and more of this. Um, and, and as some examples of uh, 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 cooperation between, let's say, uh, countries, um, you could see that uh, South America, uh, Europe, and Central Asia have all developed now unified principles for environmental governance. And what that means is that they all require uh, the same minimum level of environmental information disclosure, uh, uh, public participation in important decisions, and also access to uh, the court when things go wrong. And uh, also, I think, you know, people in BRI countries really want to improve their livelihoods uh, and have economic development, uh, as the gentleman from Ethiopia also alluded to. And I believe the focus for those countries really should be on developing uh, roadmaps for this green development and sharing success stories and experiences with each other so that they can learn from each other uh, and provide better conditions for their, for their people and at the same time achieve robust and sustainable and green economies as soon as possible. All right, thank you so much. Now we're coming to the end of this discussion. And to end, I'd like to invite each and every panelist to uh, give some concluding remarks, thoughts on today's uh, topic of discussion, the Grain BRI. Let me start with you, Director General Joe. Thank you so much. Uh, as we know, we are facing uh, opportunities and challenges I think uh, BRIGC will make uh, everything to, will do everything to make a greater contribution to the uh, uh, green transition and global sustainable development. Thank you. Mr. Zhang. 
Uh, mine is very simple. I think on the uh, greening of the whole world, uh, greening the BRI, China is not only just doing talk the talk, but actually walk the walk. And the BRGC is responsible for the walk part mm. of that effort. Mr. Soheim? The bad news is that we have a triple environment crisis of pollution, destruction of nature, and climate uh, emissions and climate change. But the good news is that we have all the policies to fight this, and it's now an enormous opportunity to get it right, to get more jobs, better health, and take better care of nature at the, at the same time. That's what um, uh, President Xi tried to put down in the slogan, green is gold. Mm -hmm. So let's do that. Let's merge economy and ecology. Uh, and Belt and Road is a major opportunity to do exactly that. All right. Simon in Singapore? Yes, thank you. I think there are three tensions in our discussion. The first is the idea of transition, of moving forward urgently and hopefully smoothly. But yet we know there's so much turbulence in the world, geopolitical turbulence, the spike in energy prices, the spike in food prices. So we have to understand that for growing Asia and ASEAN, where I'm from, these tensions of trying to move forward is not on a smooth road. And we do need help. The second is a tension between the idea of China being a very leading, powerful technology, strong country, but finding cooperation. Cooperation by the host country, of course. But I would say more multilateral cooperation, more blended finance, these are critical. The third tension is that certainly in the Belt and Road, many people look to China, finance, and take on debt. But given the economic circumstance of the world, we'll need to find other pockets of revenue, other ways of balancing the books. And here again, multilateralizing, going to the market to begin marketable products and create carbon credits. I think these market-friendly systems will be very important to emphasize as we go ahead to green and really strengthen the WI after the pause of this awful global pandemic. Thank All you. All right, Mr. Lambertini. We are finally understanding <clears throat> we cannot take the planet for granted and that uh, climate change and the loss of nature are the biggest threats to uh, the future of humanity. And so in dealing with the absolutely uh, important uh, challenge also of uh, dealing with inequality and, uh, and economic development uh, across the world, we have to combine and reconcile uh, environmental protection, climate stability. And that's the new awareness that is beginning to trigger uh, 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 union, unity around a shared plan for sustainable development. All right, Kevin. Well, first, it's been an honor and a privilege to be on the show with all of you today. The BRI is poised to be the single most transformative overseas cooperation program in this century. With South-South partnerships on green energy finance and green production, the BRI can help create a low carbon development in the global south, boost the Chinese economy, and save the earth. All right, Dimitri. I say uh, stopping coal projects in the BRI was a really great decision. And now all efforts must focus on developing a pipeline of good green projects. All right, last but certainly not least, Mustafa. We have to all work together, and the future is of multilateralism. We do not have the luxury of weaponizing climate change as the clock is ticking, and we do not have the luxury of a new Cold War. That is very thought-provoking, um, I would say. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of our panelists and our audience, friends, for tuning in, for being part of today's discussion. At the end of our program, I want to give our special thanks to Energy Foundation and World Wide Fund for Nature. Thank you for your support. I also want to thank each and every one of our panelists for their input. We learned so much about the Green BRI. And thank you for tuning in. My name is Wang Guan here at CGTN. Thank you for being part of this. I'll see you again next time.